Hey guys, I'm Chris and welcome back to Holy Shoot. Sky Ranger to Carter. Agent Carter, respond. This is Carter. Cutting it close, aren't you? We're coming in. Get on board. Shoot. Get yourself killed if you don't get on board. Okay, let's go guys. Fall back. Fall back, everyone. Fall back. E. There's too many of them. Get on board. Well guys, welcome back to the Bureau XCOM Declassified. So I guess we just finished our first mission. Only took us 2 hours, 33 minutes, and 26 seconds. Sounds about right. <laughs> uh, mission results. Invasion. Aerial photography of the group range facility indicates almost total destruction due to the combined effects of the surprise attack from unknown forces and the unscheduled detonation of classified prototype ordnance. Efforts to recover technologies, uh, technology or personnel are not advised, as it is likely that enemy opposition has remained on site. The survivors of this attack exfiltrated to an undisclosed location in order to evaluate counterattack options. Cool. How's your stat doing? Oh, cool. I'm ranked one. I'm ranked first with 31 kills, followed by Nils with has a rank of five with 17 kills, and Kinney has a rank of five with eight kills. We acquired an M14 rifle, a frag grenade, an M1897 uh, shotgun, standard pack, uh, a Z72 machine pistol. And an M1903 A4 sniper rifle. And finally, outside our activity, we killed 33 sectoids, 2 gun turrets, 25 outsiders, and 2 drones for a total of 62 kills. Let's go back to the base, guys. Narrowly escaping the attack on Groom Range, Herder and Company's director fought to a secret location to plan their next steps. So yeah, it looks like the XCOM curse may not completely plague this uh, recording session, which would be fairly nice for once. In visual range now, sir. Preparing final approach. Control, this is Sky Ranger 1 requesting permission to land. Copy, Sky Ranger. Permission granted. You are cleared for pad number three. Gonna take more than a hole in the ground to beat those things. Just admit it, you're impressed. So, what is the Bureau anyway? Bureau of Operations and Command. Never heard of it. You were never meant to. Hmm, <laughs> okay. This base wasn't meant to be operational for another year. We've called in every operative we had earmarked for the project, but, well, let's just say that we'll be a bit understaffed. Oh, good. Director Falk, sir. Welcome back. These two are with me. Well, at least this location is secure. And I intend for it to stay that way. I'll be giving a report to all staff at 0300. Report to the operations room at that time. I have a lot to prepare, Carter. Agent Weaver will show you around. <clears throat> Down here, Carter. Come on. When Ivan put Sputnik up, the brass got scared. This project became top priority. Off the books, of course. That did it. Hold it there. Uh, don't move it. All right, people. Show's over. Back to work. 
Carter, this is Nico De Silva, senior field agent. Nico, you'll be sharing your workspace with Agent Carter. Welcome to the most advanced facility on Earth. Falk wants him up and running ASAP. Time is of the essence. Straight from his mouth. Gotcha. Well, come on. Our office is right over here. That weaver is one tough broad. So, this is us. This is my desk here. Yours is over there. Get comfortable, Will. Things as they are. This is both your office and your quarters. Uh, do you mind if I call you Will? Yes, I do mind. Well, I'm not calling you Agent Carter. I might be military, but I'm not that formal. I prefer William. Yeah, well, I prefer Nico, even if my mother insists on calling me Nicholas. There are some things that are just beyond our control. I can see we'll be fast friends, you and I. Glad to hear it. My supply of friends got cut a bit short lately. That all, De Silva? Ah, for now, sure. You have any questions, just ask. And one more thing. Yeah? The old man, Director Falk. He's a hard man to impress, but you managed it. Not what I expected after reading your file. <laughs> Only pleasant surprise I've had all day. How many people around here know my history? We all know each other. Don't worry, you'll get to read up on us too. The old man thinks that the more attached we are to one another, the better we'll be in the field. The Bureau might be an adjustment for you. We work in teams here. Seems like you're more accustomed to operating alone. Yeah, well, I'm also accustomed to the enemy being human. An attack like this, it's gonna mean a lot of adjustment for everybody. I'm a different man today than I was yesterday, you know? Ain't that the truth. Where were you this morning? Did you get caught in... in any of this? No. I was out gathering intel on a weather anomaly way out in the boondocks. Something was interfering with television and radio signals. Everything except the heavy-duty military gear. Since the attack, it's gone global. They shut down our communication just before the attack. Keep us from coordinating. Smart. Sure, but there's one way it helped us. Can you imagine the panic if the public found out about an alien attack? That's a very fair point to Silva. You seem like you know your way around this place. I don't typically work out of this facility. Hell, no one really did until today. I'm with the NSA, but my post for the past few months has been with a small team that reports to Director Falk. Anomalies? What type? Different types, but all, well, supernatural. Hmm. Sounded silly to say it until a few hours ago. Mostly weather oddities, but also we've been recovering deposits of this Illyrium stuff. Who else is on this team? It was supposed to be kept small until it was needed. Now people who are pre-flagged for recruitment are coming in. Well, the ones that are still alive. People were pre-selected? From where? From the military, the clandestine service, DIA, even some civvies. No one knew that they were selected until they got the call. As of this morning, Falk activated the project and sent that call out. And before today? For the last few years, it's just been a couple dozen specialists. But now, we've got a lot of new squaddies to bring up to speed. I need to get myself oriented. Let's talk later. Sure thing, Will. Good to have you on board. Sounds like the director's about to start. Come on, let's get the good seats. Okay. Looks like it's going to be one of those days where we just go from cutscene to cutscene. Guess it means you don't have to hear too much of my voice. Aha! Uh -huh. Lights. We are at war, and not the one we were expecting. Groom range, 2100 hours. Survivors, six. In just a few minutes, our enemy managed to destroy the primary strategic command center. By 2130, strategic command itself ceased to exist. Our combined military forces have been routed. The comms have gone dark. The red phone will not be ringing. And that is why, as of now, I, Myron Falk, I'm assuming command of what's left of our nation's defenses. 
The Bureau was founded to coordinate resistance forces in the event of a complete and successful Soviet invasion. That mission remains the same, even if our enemy does not. We now face an opponent from beyond our world, whose identity is yet unknown. But make no mistake, this enemy has crippled us. They have technology decades beyond what we possess. We must make it our own. Their weapons will become our weapons. And when they do, we shall annihilate them. I give you new orders. Survive. Adapt. Win. Welcome to XCOM. He said the thing! can help them. Let me help them. Will. 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 Carter. Hey, Will, wake up. <sighs> what? Jesus, Carter. How is it you look worse than before you went to sleep? <laughs> you woke me up, that's how. I'm fine. And you yelling for me to wake up doesn't help. I wasn't the one yelling. I haven't slept more than a couple hours in years. Yeah, well, I wouldn't worry about it. Like I said, this is our office and our bunks. Maybe someday they'll get the barracks up and running. No, I mean, I barely sleep at all. Well, can't say I blame you. Not after the morning you had. Anyway, Falk's looking for you. Wants you in his office. ASAP, as always. The old man say what he wanted with me? Ha! <laughs> Guess you don't know him all that well yet. The director doesn't tell anyone anything he doesn't think they need to know. Okay. Do we... do we sleep in the office? Well, I guess you can't really hold knocking off for a few against me. Seeing as how we seem to be in our office and our quarters. Yeah, I guess some parts of the emergency plan leave something to be desired. Ah well, it'll be just like college, right? <laughs> yeah. Except I stayed in Mrs. Hawthorne's boarding house back in Terre Haute. Had my own bathroom and everything. Wow, well, ain't you fancy. <laughs> Were you saying something about that radio? Oh, yeah. Cheap thing normally just pipes in the company elevator music. But it's been picking up some weird signal. Damned if I know what it is. Don't we have more important issues to deal with? Uh, sure, that's why I haven't bothered with it. But if someone on the outside is able to broadcast through that jamming signal, well, it could be important. Who would know more about this? Check with Operator Chelsky. She's information officer for the Bureau. Keeps track of communications, arranges contacts, manages what the public hears. The whole deal. Interesting. We're gonna go check I the radio. Gotta go see what the old man wants. See you later, Will. Report, sir. Name William James Carter, born 4th of November 1920 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to Beryl and Jeremiah Carter. Education, uh, Bachelor's of Engineering from Indiana, widowed. Family, Beryl Carter, Nate Douglas, mother, deceased in 1952. Jeremiah Carter, father, deceased in 1959. Julia Carter, Nate Crenshaw, wife, deceased in 1959. Richard Carter, son, deceased in 1959. Professional record. William Carter joined the Army December 17, 1941, leaving college to enlist shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Harbor. He saw action in the Pacific Theater and earned the rank of Master Sergeant with commendations for his service in the Burma Campaign. The service ended on October 25, 1945, after which he returned to college on the GI Bill. Shortly after graduating, the CIA recruited Carter in 1948 as field operative. 
His quick thinking and bravery served him well as he rose through the ranks, earning personal commendations from both Director Hoover and President Truman. He excelled at deep cover assignments, serving for weeks or months at the time in Indochina and the USSR. In 1959, during a deep cover assignment in Laos, a fire at his family home in Arlington killed his father, wife, and son. However, due to the communications blackout of his mission, Carter did not learn of the tragedy until he returned in 1960. He alternates between blaming himself and the agency for the tragedy. This, as much as anything else, led to his drinking problem. Following a string of disciplinary charges in de December of 1960, William Carter was reassigned to domestic operations only. Continued problems led to a further demotion to administrat administrative duties in June 1961. Director's Addendum Myron, this one's aggressive, temperamental, and defensive, but he gets the job done. I don't recommend him. But the Bureau is your department. If you insist on him, I don't recommend a long-term position. The man used to be a hero, but now he's busy destroying himself. He's not useful for much anymore except as an expendable asset. From J. Edgar Hoover. Wow. Ain't that brutal. I want to go... Let's read up on you, shall we, D'Souza? Or De Silva, I should say. Nicholas Alexander De Silva, born 17th of August 1921 in Baltimore to Catherine and Sylvester De Silva, education at JD International Law and complete New York University. Marital status, divorce. Sylvester De Silva, father, deceased 1925. Catherine De Silva, mother, deceased 1940. Elizabeth Montaigne, ex-wife, De 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 divorced 1952, living in Washington, D.C. Nicholas De Silva Jr., son, estranged, living in Washington, D.C. D.C. Laura Harper, daughter, illegitimate, living in New York, New York. Professional record. Joined the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department uh, August 12, 1947. Advanced to deputy sheriff with high accommodations for field work and began to pursue a career with the FBI as a legal analyst. During his screening, the FBI discovered that Silva had not completed his JD degree. Having dropped out of college due to financial concerns and falsified his credentials, Deputy De Silva lost his job on December 24, 1951, which quickly led to the collapse of his marriage. However, the FBI was impressed by De Silva's record with the MPD as well as his interpersonal skills, and on February 14, 1952, they recruited him on a probationary basis for field work. He demonstrated exceptional skills in the field and received a small degree of fame for the heroic single-handed arrest of the bank robber Katie Carpenter on February 4, 1955. Despite this acclaim, Agent De Silva was repeatedly demoted back to probationary agent due to various moral concerns about his activities when off-duty. In 1959, after an embarrassing arrest in New York City where he and a jazz singer assaulted an officer, the FBI decided to move him out of visible work. At Director Falk's request, Agent Nico De Silva was reassigned to work with the Bureau as a covert agent. Interesting. What if I can go talk to you more? After that, I need to go talk to the person about the radio. E. What is it, Will? I'd better go see what the old man wants. See you later, Will. Okay, I... Radio. Communications. Who are all these people? You? You the one I talk to? Who do I talk to about this? Do I talk to you? How about you? No? Okay. So glad we had this talk. F5. Oh, that radio. I see. E. Two. Message repeats. Two. Five. Zero. Better make a note November. of this and talk to one of the Eight. radio operators. Nine. You probably Two. ought to run that by Operator Chelsky Message across repeats. the hall. Might be important. Two. Five. Zero. November. Eight. Nine. Two. Cool. Let's do it. You the dispatcher. A little more than that, Agent Carter. I'm Chief Information Officer with the Bureau. Information Officer? What does that mean? I oversee the dispatchers, but in addition to that, I also manage our public communications and keep our profile low. And for now, my job is also keeping the public from knowing the scope of the threat. 
Makes sense. Because rioting mobs of civilians are the last thing we need right now. Exactly. You and your agents contain the enemy's attacks, and my operators will keep the public panic level in check. Impressive. I'll try not to distract you too much. As long as you have a good reason. What do you need, sir? How are we broadcasting? Isn't the enemy jamming all communications? Yes, most broadcasting equipment is facing heavy interference, cutting effective range down to less than 5% of normal. Then how are you... Our equipment is significantly more robust. We're still communicating at approximately 90% of effective range. The best of the best, you know. Okay. What's the... How's everyone what doing? What's the population know? They're worried about the communications blackout, but our operatives in the major cities are keeping them in line. Keeping them in line? You make it sound like they've declared martial law. Nothing as heavy-handed as that. Just a series of emergency preparedness tests. They'll be tense, but orderly. Radio's been playing a strange broadcast. Any idea what it means? I heard. It's probably an automated weather station nearby, but I suppose it might be instructions for picking up a weaker signal. A clever broadcaster could bypass the worst of the jamming that way. It could be survivors. We could bring them in. It's worth checking out. I'll have Operator Hughes run the radio while you give us the data. First set the range to... Set the range to 500. Now the direction? Set the direction north. And the frequency? Set the frequency to 374 megahertz. That's Taking so wrong. medium frequency. And I've taken enough of your time. Yes, sir. Okay, so that was flat out wrong. I need to go listen to that radio again. See what it has to say. You. Nope. I wonder. Two five zero, November eight nine two. So two fifty eight ninety two. Two fifty eight ninety two. Two fifty eight ninety two. Yes, sir. The radio's been playing a strange broadcast. Any idea what it means? I heard. It's probably an automated weather station nearby, but I suppose it might be instructions for picking up a weaker signal. A clever broadcaster could bypass the worst of the jamming that way. It could be survivors. We could bring them in. It's worth checking out. I'll have Operator Hughes run the radio while you give us the data. First set the range to... 250. Set the range to 250. Now the direction? North. Set the direction north. And the frequency? 892. Set the frequency <laughs> to 892 megahertz. Checking ultra high frequency. Nothing. W wait. What is. It's survivors. They're trying to warn others of the attack. Reply. Tell them they aren't alone. We'll do what we can to assist. We'll dispatch someone to help, but we'll also have to make sure they stop broadcasting immediately. We can't risk that information spreading. As long as they get rescued. And we'll see if they do, and we'll go see Director Falk on the next episode. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next